Hello, in this video we're going to start our study of semiconductor devices. Given your study of circuit analysis, you should be familiar with a simplified Bohr model of an atom. And we begin with silicon number 14 on the hit list. Now, we don't use strictly just silicon. There are other materials we might use, but silicon is sort of the big one. Now, the electron configuration, you might recall, has a very specific order in terms of shells. We can have two in the first, eight in the next, 18 in the next, and so forth. Follows the 2n squared sequence. So silicon being number 14 has an electron configuration of 2, 8, and 4. So our simplified Bohr model, we would just say looks like this. Nucleus is plus 4, and then in that outer uh, energy level, that outer um, uh, valence shell, we simply have four electrons. Now, if we were doing an energy graph, remember what you see is something at discrete line level. So, for example, if n is equal to 1, we might have something like this. And then for, you know, n is 2, we get something like that. And n is 3, right, and so on and so forth. So these are discrete energy levels. In between, those are forbidden, right, because of the structure of the atom, those are forbidden. So if you have these very discrete sorts of levels that we're dealing with, right? So we have four, four electrons in the highest or valence shell. Now, what happens when we have a crystal? So what we're talking about here is called an intrinsic structure, an intrins intrinsic uh, crystal, silicon crystal. So it's pure, right? It's nothing but this perfectly formed uh, lattice of silicon atoms. Now, this is, of course, three-dimensional, and I can't really draw it that way. So what we're going to do is sort of a modified, flat, two-dimensional um, Bohr model, basically, simplified Bohr model, where we're just looking at the valence. So we would see something like this. I'm going to draw a bunch of these. All right, so I've got um, sort of a set here. And, of course, this would just continue out in all directions. Right? Like I said, in reality, it's a um, three-dimensional thing. They're not on a flat plane. They're, you know, structured in a, a more complex sort of way, but I can't draw that. Okay, so what we wind up with, here's our first one. This has four electrons, um, and that would be true for all of the other ones. But what winds up happening is we get a sharing of electrons. So we have something that looks like this. This gets us eight electrons in the valence, which makes for a nice, stable uh, system. All right. So basically what ends up happening is we have the four that we started with for our center one, and then it picks up sort of shares one with this neighbor, and it shares one with this neighbor, and this neighbor, and this neighbor. And likewise, they're doing the same thing. In other words, you know, if this one has four, let's just say it was this one, this one, this one, and this one, then, you know, there is another silicon atom out here, and it has four, so, you know, there's one there, there's one out here, there's one over here, there's one over here, as does this one have four, right? So maybe it's got this one, it's got one over there, there's the pair that's shared, you know, and on and on it goes, right? We could just keep drawing this like crazy. So these are uh, covalent bonds, right? Valent, right? the valence shell, the outer shell. And as I said, having eight in that um, valence is 
a very stable situation. Now, if we draw up the uh, energy diagram, something a little interesting happens here, a little bit more interesting happens. Now, on this axis, you can imagine this to be the distance across. So you just imagine we have this pure silicon crystal. Just imagine going across it. What do we see? Well, at any given point, you know, you don't have an isolated atom anymore. You know, there are other atoms out here in this crystal lattice, and they all affect the um, sort of the environment, if you will, for any given atom. Consequently, what ends up happening here is that these discrete levels sort of fuzz out. They kind of, they kind of blur, all right? So instead of having these kinds of things, we have bands, thicker bands. Now, I'm only going to draw the valence band. All right, so here's our valence band, the top one. And then above this is the conduction band. All right, this is where your free electrons live. Now, depending on the you know, relationship between these two things, this will tell you whether you have a conductor, you know, if they're like right on top. Okay, so it's very easy for a, an electron to go from the valence to the conduction band. All right, you have a nice conductor. If they're really far apart, you get an insulator. Um, in a case like this, if there's sort of a modest spacing, we end up with what's called a semiconductor, right? What we want to look at. Now, an important thing to consider is something called the Fermi level. So I'm just going to draw that. In this case, it's smack dab in the middle. So the Fermi level is sort of a statistical thing. It's the point at which it's the 50% point where we have charges above and below that. All right. There's a 50% likelihood above versus below. This is going to be important when we start looking at our sort of mixed semiconductors. All right. Now, if we have some thermal energy in the system, there can be enough energy to pop an electron from the valence band into the conduction band. And what that does is it leaves behind a hole. In other words, a place where electron should be, should have been, if you will. That, in turn, allows another electron to pop into that hole, which leaves behind another hole, which another electron could pop into. So you hear people talking about, you know, the flow of electrons, or electron flow, but you also hear them talk about hole flow. What the heck? Hole flow? What is that? Well, here's probably the easiest way to explain whole flow. Um, I'm going to use some little helpers over here. Okay, so each one of these is going to represent an electron. All right, okay, so there's a hole, right? That's a hole. So here's what happens. There's some, like maybe some thermal energy comes in here, right? This thing is not sitting at uh, absolute zero. It's sitting at uh, room temperature. So this electron can pop into that uh, higher conduction band, leaving behind a hole. What ends up happening? This could move into that hole, which means this one can move into this hole. This one can move there. That one can move there. All right, so they've all moved along. We've had some motion through the through the crystal here, right? Well, you know, if we just sort of back this up and look at this quickly, the process, what you're really seeing is the hole going this way. That's what we call hole flow, right? You could say, well, each one of these things went this way a little bit, or you could just keep your eye on the hole, right? Keep your eye on that little circle, and effectively it's going the opposite way. That's what hole flow is. Okay. To continue. That by itself, interesting, but not the most exciting thing. Where it comes interesting is when we start throwing in impurities. What we start talking about is an extrinsic material, also known as a doped crystal.
we use something called a dopant. And basically what a dopant is, is something that has either more or fewer electrons in its valence shell, in its outer shell. Right? So here's how it works. I'm going to use the same kind of diagram. Um, in the center here, I'm going to say we have, we have uh, two options here. Um, we can use something that has more electrons or less electrons. So I'm going to start with the idea of having more electrons. We can use something that's pentavalent, right? Penta meaning five. So we refer to these as, as I've said, dopants or impurities. Um, this is also known as a donor because it has an extra, extra electron. Now you could write this as plus five, for example. So it has five electrons. Now the surrounding uh, area is these normal uh, silicon atoms, right? So I'm just going to draw a bunch of those, kind of like I did before. There are much nicer drawings in the text than what I'm doing here. Sorry. Um, so we have, again, the sharing that we had before. We have that covalent bond. But, but, because this is pentavalent, it has five electrons in the valence shell. So there's an extra one out here. Right? There's our extra electron. Yay! So we have a surplus, right? Now, you might ask, well, how do I even get them in here? Okay, well, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, a simple way is through what's called diffusion. Basically, we take this pure silicon crystal, we put it in an oven, we heat it up, and we introduce the, um, the dopant, right? the, in this case, the penavalent donor, um, in a gaseous state, and it sort of seeps into the crystal, kind of like a sponge soaking up water. Right? That's one way. Another way is through implant. Uh, implantation that's kind of like imagine the the crystal is like a big mound of sand and you've got the dopant it's a rock and you're whipping that rock into the mound of sand as hard as you can right so they kind of get buried in there that's another way to do it but however it's done we wind up with a bunch of extra electrons now it's not this four to one ratio that i'm giving you but it's a much smaller ratio than that but all we really need to understand is that there are extra electrons in here. Okay, So what does that do as far as our um, energy bands? Well, what we wind up with is something that looks like this. Here's our valence shell. Then conduction's up here. But since we have these extra electrons, the donor level is up here. Now what that does is it takes our Fermi level and pushes it up here. So the Fermi level is closer to the conduction band. It's no longer pretty much even, right? It's much closer to the conduction. My drawing is not perfect, but you get the basic idea, right? So here's our new Fermi level that's been pushed up. Okay, now because we have an extra number of electrons, the electron is referred to as the majority carrier. That's the majority charge carrier. We still have holes, of course, as explained before, but there's smaller numbers, so the hole is the minority carrier. Okay, now, if instead of using a pentavalent, what happens if we use trivalent? In other words, three, right, tri. This is also known as an, as an acceptor. Well, 
let's just use our original diagram. We've got a plus three over here. Okie doke. So, all right, so one there, one from him, 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 and he only has three, right? So I'm going to draw this as a little hole, because there should have been, you know, if that was silicon, four, there should have been an electron there. So we're missing one, we're down one, right? So as you can guess, the uh, hole is the majority carrier here. And the electron is the minority carrier. Now, our energy diagram looks something like this again. There's the balance, and above it will be conduction band. Now, with what we're doing here, of course, we're talking about uh, this entire crystal, right? So, as I said, if you think of this as the distance, this is consistent across this whole thing. I'm sort of ignoring surface effects, but ideally, this is what we would have: is this I deal sort of situation, right? Everything's consistent. So what ends up happening here, donor level's now way down here. And as you can guess, that pushes the Fermi level below where it used to be. Okay. Last thing, names of this, right? We don't talk about a pentavalent semiconductor or a pentavalent doped extrinsic semiconductor. Because this has an extra electron, it's net negative. So we call this n-type, right? N-type, that's the term. This one, p-type, right? You can think positive because it's a whole. So we talk about n-type and p-type semiconductors. Now, with what we have right now, by varying the, uh, the amount of doping, in other words, the ratio of dopant to crystal, uh, original silicon, we can effectively change the resistivity of the material and you know, use this for resistors, for example. You can make a semiconductor resistor this way. Um, that's certainly handy. But if that's all we could do, you know, eh, semiconductors wouldn't have taken over the world, so to speak, and we wouldn't be uh, quite so concerned. Where it gets interesting is when we combine P-type and N-type materials into a single device. Now, when I talk about combining them, I don't mean we're going to take a piece of P-material and a piece of N-material and you know glue them together or bolt them together they're not mechanically joined this has to be done in a single original crystal sort of various steps of doping that's where we get things like diodes various kinds of transistors other semiconductor devices so we're going to talk about sort of the building block of this which is the pn junction Right, one piece of P and one piece of N. Right. We're going to talk about the P-N junction in the very next video. See you then.